What is it about the New York, New Jersey area these days? All of a sudden, for years, it didn't seem like a lot of bands were coming out of that part of the world. But then you get the Strokes in the early part of the century, then you get the Yeah, Yeah, Yeahs, and now we have this explosion of bands from, from Manhattan and from Brooklyn and from, from Jersey. What's going on there? I think that people, um, the generation gap kind of caught up. There was like these kids that were growing up in uh, the early 80s that, whose parents were just complete products of the 70s. And I think that what happened is you started to find those bands that grew up on the Rolling Stones and like the early Clash records and all this, this mixture of rock and roll records started forming their own bands and growing up. And then now it was their time that they were starting their own bands and playing all around these places. And this, because the, the, the common thing about all the bands there is they all have that same kind of classic rock sound. Mm -hmm. You know, like that band, The Nationals, from there, they're from Brooklyn. And uh, even with The Strokes, that was kind of like the, the, a little bit older than us, but they came out around the same time. And I think that there's a lot of bands that kind of realized there hadn't been any bands from that area in a while. And they were kind of like, well, what's going on? Let's, let's go. Let's do this. So. Yeah, there there were some uh, some really hardcore like Slint and, and some of the the more harder core ones, and then you know now we're seeing bands like uh, like you, Hold Steady, uh, Parlor Mob, yep. you know all all great bands with with a real familiar sort of sound and approach yet fresh. There's a lot of like excitement I think about these kind of new new bands, and I think they're all kind of inspiring each other to do it, and I think that the Hold Steady and there's a band called the Loved Ones from Philadelphia. And uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of bands kind of feeding off of each other that are like really, they're, they're all, it's almost like this collective of people that are kind of like, they're all pretty encouraging of each other, they're all fans of each other. And it, it kind of feels like it's, it's like a little group of, uh, of bands that are like, this is our time to do it, let's do it. Like, let's, you know, let's change this and see what we can come out with well, it. What do you guys play? I mean, when an outsider thinks of, of New York or Jersey, I mean, you know, CBGB's, uh, you know, Max's Kansas City, and yeah. all these places that don't exist <laughs> no, anymore. No. Nobody's there anymore. Uh, now it's like uh, there's there's the Roseland and there's Webster Hall. There was a great place called the Knitting Factory that kind of closed down. Right, yeah. That was a smaller place, like a that's where we grew up in. And uh, there's a lot of bars that you could start in from a small level. There's like the Court Tavern in New Brunswick, which is the Bouncing Souls play there, and, and a lot of bands play there. But uh, there's the Stone Pony still there, so uh, a lot of bands started playing there again. And, I think um, if anybody decided to tear down the Stone Pony, there'd be a revolution. Yeah, Bruce has like got a stronghold on the Stone Ponies. I think he's uh, I think he's in the government in New Jersey, I'm pretty <laughs> sure, unelected official. But uh, yeah, there's uh, there's this great place called Webster Hall. It's in New York that uh, a lot of great bands play. The Cold War Kids play there. We're playing there in uh, two weeks. It's just that's probably my favorite venue. Um, Owned by a Canadian. Really? Yep. See, perfect. Um, but uh, there's also the Wellmont Theater in New Jersey, where uh, like Dylan's played there a few times, like on a smaller scale. Um, there's a lot of a lot of new venues, but a lot of the classics have kind of faded off. Like there is no Max's Kansas City, and there's no, you know, like the Bottom Lounge. I think is still there. Is the Continental still there? No, I don't it's think gone so. Too. Yeah, that. I mean, I remember that from when I was growing up. Like there was a lot of shows there, but uh, the Wetlands isn't there anymore. And, like none of those real venues where everybody started out. They're just ABC No Rio, that collective, which is kind of like a DIY thing, yeah. that's still there. It's interesting because maybe what needed to happen is that all these old places needed to be wiped out so a new generation could come in and build their own. That's probably true because, I mean, when you play any of those places like CBGB's, you know, you, it's the Ramones place, it's Bondi's place, you know, it's not yours. It's, right. it's something that you're kind of trying to dig up the history of to try and absorb some of that. But now with these places where, you know, maybe only a thousand bands have played there ever, uh, you can kind of, you're making your own history as you're playing there. And maybe someday somebody will write about Webster Hall, which would be pretty cool. That would be really cool. So let's talk about uh, Gaslight Anthem. Uh, how long you guys been around? Uh, you got a couple of albums now. Um, just let's hear, hear your life story. Uh, it's been three years, and uh, we kind of just started out in the, the New Brunswick basement scene and just got together and started playing our friends' basements and then generally moved up to the, the different bars in the area. and. We just kind of went on tour immediately and started touring everywhere. And we did uh, a U.S. tour, and within like two months of our first record, Sink or Swim, coming out, we had a European tour, and we just did all these grassroots things. Like there was just kids throwing shows for us in like a rented out venue, or not even a venue sometimes, like a like a hall or a youth center, all over the world that we were playing all these shows in. And it kind of just, for us it was like, 
it seems for like the, the public that it was quick, but for us, we've been kind of building it up and scrambling and just being on tour for three years straight. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how we started and got here. Obviously, you're, you're fans of, of Jersey guys came before you like Springsteen, but you're also a big uh, strummer fan. Huge strummer fan. Yeah. I would say that directly influencing, uh, I mean, Springsteen is more like an icon, but like musically and thought-wise, like with the thought process and things like that, Joe Strummer's probably like, Joe Strummer and Tom Waits are like huge. You, you actually wrote a song about Strummer. Completely, yeah. It was kind of like, a, like I found out when he died and it's kind of like a letter to, it was weird because it was kind of like a letter to his wife about like what he meant to a kid from New Jersey. Like this is what, you know, he meant to a kid across the pond that you'll never meet, ever, you know, and this is, this is the most important thing to me that, that kind of shaped my musical outlook. I can tell you a story that he actually came in here. Really? Uh, a number of years ago. It was a Saturday. And he was going to do an interview on the radio, and he was tired and had a cold and was hungover and all the rest of it, and he asked for a bucket so he could hork into it. <laughs> and all these people had showed up to, you know, this is Joe Strummer. This yeah. Is just, and he had this beat up guitar, just like you expect he would have. Yeah. And he was going to play some stuff, some Mescalero stuff or whatever. And there were so many people in the studio because we had invited people in. He couldn't hear himself warm up vocally, and he couldn't hear the tuning of his guitar. Oh, no. So this studio is on the, uh, on the streets, on the main drag of Young Street here in Toronto. So while everybody was waiting for him to set up, he bolts out the door. And it's a Saturday afternoon, and people are walking <laughs> up and down the streets, and he finds a fire hydrant out in front of the, out of the, front of the radio station. And he just starts singing, just like Woody would have. Wow strumming away, singing at the top of his lungs, not caring what people were thinking. And I remember watching this one guy walk past him, stop, turn back and look and go, no, I can't be, and kept on walking. Oh, wow. It, it was just That's one of those things you pay a million dollars yeah. just to see, you know, like for a second. Like, it, what wouldn't you give to see that, you know? Uh, it, was, it, was, it was an amazing moment. Oh. And, and then a few months later, he dies. And, and, uh, and along with him and with, with uh, Joey Ramone, those were the two. I don't get attached to rock stars. Yeah. But with, with him and with Joey, it hurt. They don't seem to be real rock stars, though. Like, no. I feel like those guys kind of... Like, I imagine, like, like, a, like, a Bob Marley fan would have felt about Bob Marley. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, that, that he, did, he so, it seemed like he was more like your, your grandfather or your father or something like that. You or know or I mean? a big brother who was always yeah. there for you when you needed something, you needed cheering up, you needed inspiring, you needed, uh, you know, a, a stern talking to. Yeah. You put on a, a Marley record, you put on a Strummer record, you put on a Ramones record, something, everything, everything's okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think their fragileness and their failures kind of allowed them to be, mm. you know, their flaws as a person. Because I don't think that they hit it too much. You know, you could see that they were, they were fragile in some aspects. And uh, oh, and they didn't make any bones about it. Yeah, you know, we're human. We're imperfect. We screw up. Yeah, and that that kind of makes them even more real. You know what I mean? Where a lot of these people, you don't ever get to see the uh, the other side of the, you know, the coin for them because they they hide it pretty well.